supporting you in your dog parenting journey. The Dynamic Dog Owner with Debbie Potter. Hello um, and welcome. So again, we're continuing with the series about my dogs. So I have three dogs in case you hadn't noticed by now. And today we are talking about my middle dog, Rem, Remus. And I warn you now, this might be a long episode because there is a lot to talk about. I mean, I don't know where to start. To be honest, Rem needs his own podcast dedicated just to him and all of the challenges we have overcome and all of the behaviours and emotions we have <laughs> unpacked with him. So let me start by saying one thing. This dog has been my most challenging dog, but he has changed my life. And that is no understatement. He has changed mine and my family's lives for the better. Um, we didn't always think that, but he is incredible. So I warn you now, if this is a long one, I apologise. I might have to split it into two separate episodes because there's a lot to talk about. So I had always planned when I got Dave, the puppy before Rem, that I would wait until he was around three or four before we got another dog. But... Dave was not destined to be a single dog. He loved our previous dog so much and he really missed having another dog in the house. So we decided to get another dog, a second dog, sooner than I had planned. That kind of begs the question, did we rush into it? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Who knows? So I started my quest to look for another dog and I instantly thought, well, let's have a golden retriever. So I inquired with a few golden retriever breeders and then I thought, oh, I can't have another one. Leo just left such a hole in my heart. I was like, it is too soon for another golden retriever. I can't have another golden retriever. He was too special. But it is how I met Fred's breeder. So I'll talk to you about that in Fred's episode. So we decided we would get another lab. Um, and for many reasons, it turned out that I didn't really want another black one. I wasn't fussed about a yellow or a chocolate one. So we thought, why not get a fox red? They're completely different and unique. <laughs> if only I'd known then what I know now, I would never have made that decision. Um, <laughs> but we decided on a fox red and we started looking for breeders. And I found it quite challenging because fox red labs tend to be uh, used more for working line gun dog jobs rather than families. So trying to find a breeder that wasn't bringing them up to be a gun dog, uh, living in a you know, being bred and living outside rather than in a family home was really hard so eventually we found out we found rem obviously the journey getting him the girls were a little bit older we knew dave was going to love him um it was very exciting but then he came home <laughs> and so it began <laughs> Um, it seems like it should be like a uh, entrance to a big Lord of the Rings kind of film. Very, very quickly, I realised that this dog was not a thing like Dave and the textbook had to be thrown out the window. He changed every view I had on how to raise a puppy. Um, after doing all the things we did with Dave, I slept on the sofa, I had the puppy pen next to me. Every night I moved it further away. After a week of sleeping on the sofa and not being able to move the puppy pen more than a foot away from me, I was like, sod that, I can't sleep on this sofa for much longer. He's just coming upstairs. <laughs> um, he couldn't be more than a foot away from me in the playpen without him crying, whimpering and being very distressed, which obviously was a telltale sign straight away. He had to be with me. If I attempted in the daytime to leave him in like, the puppy playpen that we have set up in the living room... He did one of two things, would either whine and cry to get out or would just take it in his own hands and climb out of the playpen. I remember go popping into the kitchen for maybe just grab a drink, walk back in two seconds later and a puppy was precariously balanced on top of the playpen, um, trying to climb over the top of it. And he had all four feet on top of the very, very thin metal gate. I mean, again, this should have given me an indication as to what he was going to be like. <laughs> Um, he couldn't be behind a stair gate and has separated for more than 10 seconds without instantly weeing and pooing out of sheer distress. The only time he was happy and content was when he was curled up in a ball beside me. And only me. 
it was like I was the only person in the house. Nobody else existed. Um, it was me and him. Um, and I realised after two days, OK, this is more than just a puppy settling in. There's there's stuff going on here. Um, in hindsight, and hindsight is a blimmin' wonderful thing, there were ever such small signs that looking back, I went, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have picked up on them beforehand. But simple things like when we went to visit him in his litter, I'm a strong believer that the puppy chooses you. It's like the wand chooses the wizard if you're a happy Harry Potter fan. Um, the puppy chooses you. And he chose me. We're sat there with, I think I was 11 in his litter, 11 fox reds all going round. And like the kid's like, oh, can we have this one? My husband's going like this one. I was like, this one's the one. This one that is curled up in a ball next to my side, seeking out me and going, you're my mum. He's the one. And I should have noticed that he's whimpered slightly. He was a little bit of a whimperer. That's the only thing I can look back on. Um, the day we picked him up, <laughs> my husband always rec recounts this story because it was quite amusing. We were obviously sat at the dining table, all puppy paperwork, um, ready to sign papers and hand over all the uh, you know vaccination stuff and all that kind of stuff. The breeder went to get him. They handed him to Sam whilst I did all the paperwork -y stuff. Within about two seconds, the puppy had clambered out of Sam's arms desperately across the dining table and curled up in my lap. From that moment on, I should have realised he was my dog and nobody else's <laughs> and he was going to be a handful. So we realised he needed me. He, he nothing else was good enough and he's four now he still needs his mum um after moving him upstairs because he didn't sleep in the pen a meter away from me um we moved the playpen upstairs and had him next to the bed and again it was a foot away just across the bedroom just a tiny bit um and again he he settled but he kept getting disturbed he wasn't happy he just about settled and then would get disturbed again. And I was, again, after a week, couple of weeks, I was like, I can't do this anymore. He's not happy still. What do I do? So I thought, sod it. I know he's only a puppy and he's not toilet trained yet, but up you come. Get on the bed. <laughs> you are allowed on the bed. And I think he was probably about 10 or 11 weeks old at that point. And he slept on the bed from that night onwards. And he has ever since. Um... As a young puppy, he slept on my chest and that was the only place he, he slept. He settled instantly and slept soundly through the night from the moment he slept on me. He had to be with me or touching me. Now, over time, gradually, as his confidence grew, he did move down the bed slightly, but he had to be touching me. So gradually he'd sleep next to me and have his head on me or a paw on me. And I remember probably when he was about... 10 months a year old he actually left the bed and slept on the floor and I was like wow that's amazing um it was a big challenge so obviously within those first few weeks I realized this isn't simply a case of him being a puppy and learning learning to be alone he had almost a panic attack when he wasn't with me he had to be with me and at that two or three weeks after we'd had him I had a choice um and the choice was, I continue forcing him to get used to something he's not ready for, forcing separation on him, or I throw out the textbook and I take a new approach and I give him what he needs. Went with the latter. For seven months, Rem didn't leave my side. And I mean didn't leave my side. Wherever I went, he went. He came absolutely everywhere with me. If he couldn't come with me, I simply didn't go. Um, so things like going to the toilet, he had to be with me. Um, cooking, he had to be by my feet. If I went to the shop, it had to be a dog friendly shop. If we went out for a walk and I needed, like, you know, you go out for a day, you need to pop to the, the, stable, the, the toilets. That couldn't happen. He, he could he would literally sit outside the toilets with my husband screaming out of sheer terror because his mum was not with him. So we started using the disabled toilets and I took him in with me. Um, it was easier. Um, 
Now, obviously, that sounds like hell on earth. It was a challenge. Let me say that it was a challenge. Um, suddenly, this little puppy that was just going to take a couple of weeks to settle in and be happy um, became a really big life changing task. Now, there are positives um, to having a dog like this. And again, it's taught me an awful lot. Um, because he came everywhere with me, he saw and experienced, sorry, I'm just pouring a drink, um, <laughs> so many things, so many things that a that Dave didn't. Um, so things that most dogs wouldn't see, he saw. And it sounds really odd because it sounds like he was a really needy, insecure puppy. He was really confident outside as long as he was with me. So he wasn't phased by other things. He wasn't phased by people, by sounds, by dogs. Wherever we went, he was happy as long as he was next to me. <laughs> I mean, it makes you feel loved, but it, it, it was challenging. Now, from this, and I'm going to carry on talking about him. Um, I've learned one thing that I try and tell everybody now with a puppy. Don't force separation on your puppy before they're ready. Because it can go one of two ways. Yeah, they can shut up and get on with it. Or they can develop severe emotional distress. So don't rush it. Don't let your puppy cry it out. Don't let them, don't force them into something they're not ready for. Because it will do the opposite of what you think it will. You need to be there for them. You're not going to damage your puppy, spoil them, mollycoddle them by giving in. Which is an awful phrase. Um, you are giving them what they need. They need to be with you. Recognising that and giving it is the best way to become a dynamic dog owner. Um, in fact, I believe it's going to make your journey easier by giving them what they need rather than forcing something on them that they're not ready for. The slower you go, the best results. So remember the hare and the tortoise. The slower you go with creating that pen independence, the more <clears throat> well-rounded and solid the dog's going to be. So because obviously Rem came everywhere, he came on boat trips. He came on days out. He went shoe shopping. He came to a theme park. Yes, we found a dog friendly theme park. Um, it's amazing when you need a dog friendly place, how many places you can actually find that are dog friendly um, when you need to take them with you and you have no choice. Now, obviously, this wasn't always easy. Um, we had to make many, many, many sacrifices. Um, sacrifices for our kids. So I was like, no, we can't go on that day out, girls, because the dog can't come. <laughs> and we can't do it. And, he's, and they were all like, oh, God, I'm such a pain. Um, and yeah, he was a challenge. But as I said to them, you know, if you need your mum, you need your mum and he needs his mum. So that's what we have to do. We have to give him what he needs. And I remember vividly, after having him about two months, we were having a conversation. Sam went, I don't know how much longer we can do this. I don't think we should keep him. I think we should rehome him. This is too much for us. And I remember sitting there going, are you serious? Are, are you actually serious? And he was like, yeah, totally. I, I, I don't know if we can do this anymore because this is taking too much. Uh, you know, it's making too much of an impact. We're not seeing progress. Um, and I think we should rehome him. And you know, when someone voices your concern and you go, yeah, maybe you're right. But you kind of suppress that feeling until somebody else says it. And I thought, yeah, I can, I, can, I know what you mean. Um, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And he is full on. Um, and I understood it completely because I, at that point, Sam and Rem had no relationship. Um, because as you've heard, he was my dog. He needed me. He literally would look at Sam as if he didn't even know who he was. He wouldn't go out to the toilet for him. He wouldn't go out for a walk with him. There was no relationship between them because Rem could only give all of his effort to me. Sam tried and occasionally, you know, there were glimmers that he liked him. Um, so he fed him, he cuddled him, he played with him. He tried to bring him to training classes, but he wasn't me, quite simply. And at that point, we did think about it seriously and went, I know what you mean. This is really hard. I don't know if we're right for him. But we came to the conclusion, I said, right, just give me a few more months. Just let's let's see how he goes over these next couple of months. And if there are no improvements and nothing's happening and you know, we'll talk about it again. But I'm very much, you know, within reason, my dogs are my dog. The second I know I'm, I meet them, <laughs> they are mine and they're in my heart. 
Um, so it was really tough decision, a tough conversation to have. Um, and we did decide to hold off and wait and think and see how we went. And I'm so glad we did. So over the next few months, a lot happened. Um, now, seven months he was by my side. Seven months. I needed him to build a relationship with somebody else. So thankfully, my mum, who's pretty wonderful, um, stepped up and she said, OK, I will help you. I will build a relationship with him. Um, he already liked her um, a little bit more than Sam anyway. Um, and she took the time to understand him and to devote to him. So she began bringing him to puppy classes um, and training classes um, at work. Um, and she brought him probably every week for a year to purely strengthen a relationship with somebody else other than me. So during those seven months, we couldn't leave him at home. But we worked on it. We worked on a minute, 30 seconds, <laughs> a minute, five minutes. Gradually, we got to 20 minutes. Um, and sometimes that was him being in the kitchen and me being in the living room. And then finally, I made the plunge and I went out. I sat in the car outside the house with the doggy camera on watching his every move. Because I wanted to make sure that I got back to him before he was stressed and before he became um, upset. And we, again, did that for a few months. Every time every time I had a spare moment, I'd be like, right, let's go and sit in the car. Um, and I'd sit in the car. He'd be in the house. I'd pop back in. Um, and then I think he was probably around nine months when I finally left him alone. And I'd say left him alone. My husband does night um, shift work. So he'd been on a night shift. He was asleep upstairs and he was due to get, oh, this sounds awful. He was due to get up within like half an hour. So I was like, right, I'm going to go out. And if there's a problem, I'll just ring Sam and he can get up and swim out. So it was a, a test almost. And then obviously we built up to him being complete on his own. And then once we'd hit that moment when he had started to mature a little bit, started to gain confidence with his adolescence, he could be left. He never enjoyed it, but he tolerated it. And what he would do is the second I shut the door, he'd I'd watch him on the camera, he'd run upstairs and he'd curl up on my pillow. So he got to the point that was closest to mum. Um, which is why I believe, again, crate training, etc., isn't great for a dog with separation because they choose where they're comfortable. He was comfortable on my bed because it's where mum is normally and it smells of her. This is a comforting place. Now, obviously, that was concise of what we had to uh, overcome with him. Um, now, when he was 10 months old, so just a few months after I could finally leave him on his own, lockdown happened. Yay. <laughs> now, for most people, they use lockdown as an excuse when it comes to dog training. Um, we don't see it much now because a lot of people didn't have, don't have lockdown dogs now because it was a little while ago. Um, but a lot of people saw it as an excuse. Oh, well, my dog's not very well behaved because he's a lockdown dog. Rem was your classic lockdown teenager. But for me, I had put far too much effort and time and commitment into building Rem's confidence, being alone. I couldn't just let it slide. I couldn't just let it subside and go back to where it was. I had to keep up with that hard work that I had put in. So every, I can't even remember what they were, but we had all the essential trips we were allowed to go on. Um, so every time we went food shopping, every time we could go somewhere, the whole family went and we all sat in the car. One person went into Tesco's, but we all sat in the car just to give Rem time to be on his own. Um, we took our daily exercise separately. Um, Sam was still working because he was a key worker. Um, so he still went to work and then he'd come back for his exercise. And then you know, we'd all work it out so that we still had at least once, once or twice a week, probably three or four times a week, actually, where we could leave Rem at home on his own. Um, now, because obviously Sam was still at work, but in between times, there was nothing to do. There was nowhere to go. I was at home. So therefore, Rem was at home because in the seven months he'd come to work with me. Um, he taught by my side. So because we were all home when Sam was home from work and there was a lot less pressure on going out and doing stuff, there was a massive, massive, massive benefit in that Sam and Rem spent more time together. And what happened is their relationship grew. In lockdown, Rem actually decided he kind of liked Sam. <laughs> um, it took a year. I mean, that is a lot of dedication on Sam's part not to give up on him. Um, but it took a year. But Rem finally went, yeah, you're all right. I'll be, we'll be friends. Now, <laughs> the, 
this is where I would suggest you be really careful when you name your dog because Rem really lives up to his namesake. Rem is named after, so he's actually, I mean, we call him Rem, but he's actually Remus. Um, and it's not Remus and Romulus, it's Remus Lupin from Harry Potter, because I am a big Harry Potter fan. Um, so if you're not a Harry Potter fan, you won't know who Remus Lupin is. Um, he is a werewolf. Um, so obviously a split personality, a very calm, quiet man that becomes a werewolf every month. Um, now that's Rem. <laughs> he has a split personality. He is the calmest most content dog when I'm home. Equally, he's blimmin' crazy and like complete split personality too. In hindsight, I shouldn't have named him Remus after a werewolf, but hey. Now, we've obviously talked about separation. There's a lot more to talk about with Rem. This is how complex my boy is. He also, as well as being um, struggling with separation, and obviously attachment issues to me. Um, he also struggles with controlling emotions, arousal and overwhelm. <laughs> Yay. So <laughs> when things change or when someone comes in the house or when something happens, when um, he needs something, we want something, he becomes very, very, very overwhelmed and aroused very, very quickly. And when he was young, he used to jump up at people's heads and he would attempt to mouth them. <laughs> Now, this is really important that it wasn't an it wasn't a bite. He wasn't trying to bite people. He was mouthing and nipping at them. But he has sharp claws and he would jump up at you. Um, and he also had crazy moments. He still has crazy moments and releases some of his emotions onto Dave by jumping up at him, barking and mouthing at him. Um, he absolutely adores him and he probably has the same level of attachment to Dave as he does to me. He pines when Dave isn't with him. Um hence it's one of the reasons uh, we're gonna do an episode about multi-dog households but um it's one of the reasons why i am really hot on all my dogs doing things separately because i want them to be apart because i i see how l in love rem is with dave and how dependent he is on him and i need to build that independence from him because one day they're not going to be together let's face it um so yes he jumps up at people's heads <laughs> um now he does he does do that to me as well he does it still to this day um, and he would jump up at me when we were out and about um, and like jump up at my head as high, high as a puppy could um, when we were out and about sort of any, from a very, very young age, from two or three months old. Um, so it wasn't jumping. He wasn't jumping out of a training issue. He was jumping because he needed my comfort. He was struggling and needed me to give him love. And he didn't know how to ask for it, quite simply. So we developed a wonderful little system <laughs> where I would firstly start to recognise when the body language cues he gave off that said, I'm starting to find this hard. And then I would either sit down on the floor um, or bend down and we would just hug for a few minutes um, to satisfy his need for comfort. And over time, we developed an even better system where he learned to target my hand and touch his nose upon my hand to say, mum, I'm struggling. So I would walk with my hand down by my side, always at his nose. Whenever he needed to seek comfort or reassurance, he would place his nose upon my hand and I'd go, yep, good boy, good boy, well done. That's it, you're okay. And I'd fuss his head. Um, and then when they started to come a little bit more frequent, I was like, okay, we need a cuddle stop. I would have to stop, sit on the floor and give him a cuddle. Um, and this is where we're over, wherever we were. <laughs> if we we're in the middle of a theme park, a middle of a shop, we just had to stop and give him cuddles. Um, absolutely crazy. Um, now, obviously, the jumping up aspect, it's train. It's not a training issue. He knows an off cue. He knows to put his feet on the floor. He knows what that means. And he knows that jumping up isn't a, a rewarded behaviour. But for him, it's an emotional release. So training isn't going to fix that. Recognising his emotions is... So what we've done over the over time is obviously carried on working with don't jump up. But equally, I have put his jump up on a cue. So if I see him getting wound up and aroused, I can ask him to jump up at my head um, and he can release his, his emotions. Um, so it's a nice way of him being able to. And again, obviously, he comes to weekly classes. To other people, it may look like he's an absolute nutter. But they don't know the reasons why I do the things I do. And they don't know all of the stuff we've been through together. 
they often see a really, really, really well-behaved dog because he is a really emotional dog, but he's also a really clever dog. Um, he is full of emotions and arousal issues and just... Um, but he's incredibly clever. He just struggles with managing emotions. So he can open the front doors, ones that open towards you and ones that open away from you. Hence, my front garden is now fenced. He can open a clip lid storage container to help himself to choose. The other dogs look at him and go, how did you do that? And they still haven't worked it out. <laughs> he's very, very, very clever. So over the last four years, I have tried absolutely everything you name it we've tried it um we've tried calming sprays natural supplements calming tablets from the vet body wraps um holistic treatments everything not to fix him but to see if they just take the edge off and help him emotionally and manage his emotions a little bit more um some of them have worked some of them haven't some have worked for a little bit of time some haven't some have been ongoing treatment so rem is now four and we are finally, finally seeing him in general be a little bit more relaxed. Um, he still has his outbursts when things change. Um, that's, I don't think, it's ever going to happen because he's got just got big emotions. Um, now, why is he more relaxed now? I don't know. There's a few factors. Again, it's always a bit of a science experiment. We don't really know. Um, it could be down to the fact that he's maturing. Um, he's now matured. Um, it could be that he has learnt what he needs, and we have learnt what he needs, and we now don't wait for him to ask for it, we know to give it to him before he asks. It could be that he's just learning what to do a little bit more, his emotions are becoming less. It could be the recent hair mineral sample test we've taken, which I think has been amazing. Um, if you haven't heard of it, they're amazing. I, I, I have one for my daughter, I have one for the dog. Um, it's a sample of your hair, which gives the most recent um, analysis of your what minerals and chemicals are in your body um, so we've done that twice now for REM to see the changes and they get sent off to lab they get tested and then you get a supplement basis that is directly what your dog needs or your person needs and they are lacking so it's tailored specifically to them and what their body needs to be able to function I found it fascinating that these people the scientists in the lab knew nothing other than he was a Labrador and he was four um, and they literally describe my dog to a T. <laughs> um, and it's really fascinating. He's been having daily supplements now for, I want to say about eight months. Um, maybe that's why things are starting to calm down a little bit. I don't know. Who knows? We don't know. It's always just a trial and error system until you find something that works. So now to this day, um, he still has his daily supplements. He still has top-up supplements for calming sometimes if we're doing something stressful. He regularly wears a calming jacket, um, some days more than others, but most days, every day, he has a calming jacket on. Um, we naturally undertake T-touch um, strokes and moves with him. Um, he has a regular sports massage. He has regular chiropractic treatment. And he also has cranial osteopath treatment um, once, twice a year. That's an awful lot for my dog. It's crazy. Um, he still needs a lot of careful management, especially when I come home. Um, a lot of his behaviour centres around me. Um, so he'll often be really calm when I'm not at home and then absolutely crazy when I am. Um, and it's pure emotions. His emotions are huge when I re-enter the home. Um, and it can take him up to an hour to calm down and to be able to think and accept love from me because there's just such big emotions. And we have to do a lot of preparation <laughs> before I come home. I have to almost give like a, an announcement. I announce myself half an hour before I'm coming home so that whoever's at home can do what they need to do to help him manage it better. Um, unfortunately, his energy does feed into the other dogs. Um, thankfully, they're both very, very chilled out. So they don't get completely riled by him but they do feed off of his energy and start acting silly just because rem is and rem kind of uses them as an outlet sometimes not in an aggressive way but just in a let's run around and be silly together please we do it with me um but the others calm down much quicker and then eventually their energy takes over it's it's really fun it's great um it's one of the reasons we don't have guests around um i don't have any guests around other than people who will understand rem because most people see him as being a really naughty dog because they're not prepared to look into the emotions that drive his behaviour. 
Um, so only people that will accept my REM are allowed in the house. Um, <laughs> this is why I say he's changed my life. Um, <laughs> so having got to know him over the last four years, I think he's autistic, quite simply. Um, we have people that have, obviously, if you don't know much about autism, um, it's a neurological diversity. Um, we have a brain. We can be autistic. Dogs have a brain. Therefore, in my opinion, it's something I'd like to research. Um, dogs can be autistic. And I feel I can say this because both of my daughters are autistic. My husband is self-diagnosed autistic. I'm self-diagnosed ADHD. Um, and I see an awful lot of similarities between him and them, um, especially my daughter who also has anxiety disorder, um, because they are so similar in how they operate. And you can see the changes and how he struggles with certain things simply because of how he he works and how he operates. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so I do think that's a, a big similarity. Um, he may sound like an absolute loon, but he and my eldest daughter are so similar. And the connection they have, because they understand each other, is incredible. Now, he is my most challenging dog, hands up. He's my most complex, challenging dog. But equally, he is the easiest. He is the most reliable. Um, he's the one I trust off lead. He's the one I can take anywhere. He's the one I trust wholeheartedly with people. Um, and it is, like I say, that complete werewolf split personality. So it sounds like he's a bit of a challenge. He is and he has been. But this dog has taught me so much about how emotions drive behaviour um, about how dogs are similar to people. Um, and one of the biggest things is that down to all the learning experience I've had to help him and how I've adapted our world and our lifestyle to help him, I've actually transferred that knowledge into my family and into how I parent my children, um, thanks to my dog. Um, one of the reasons that my kids don't go to school um, is directly down to the lessons I have learned through this dog. Um, again, that's a podcast episode for another day because I could talk about that for a little while too. Um, so the thing is, and the main thing is here, from the outside looking in, he can look like an absolute, awful, terrible dog. Equally, when you see him in his right environment, he can look like the best dog in the world. And what we see as being bad behaviour is often emotions. He looks naughty he looks out of control he looks mad we know and anyone who knows him knows that he is simply struggling in the current environment through due to his emotional state so this is why we are very very hot on in the dog world looking at emotions emotions drive behavior we don't simply try and squash a behavior and fix the behavior and stop it from happening we look at why why is the dog feeling that way what emotion is behind here? How can we change their emotion? And how can we satisfy their need? So if you think your dog is naughty, stop and ask yourself, how are they feeling? And is it actually a feeling that is driving this? Or is it a training behaviour? Because training and emotions are two very, very different things. So obviously this is a double length episode today about Rem. And it's literally just touched the surface of him. There's so much more to talk about about Remus. Um, <laughs> he's fabulous. OK, he is absolutely fabulous. Um, he's handsome. He's gorgeous. He's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful dog. Um, but there is so much that I have learned through him that has helped me to help other people. Um, and that's the main thing. So if there's one thing to take away from today is give your puppy time, however much time they need to grow and recognise that we can't simply get rid of a, of a behaviour we don't like. We have to look at emotions that drive behaviour and we have to satisfy the need that that emotion is saying. Um, so when we satisfy the needs of the emotions, we actually eliminate behaviour. So if you've got any questions about REM or if you want me to explore any more topics about REM, um, shout because I could talk about him for hours. Um, he literally has tested my patience on a million, a million levels. Um, but as I said, he's the best dog going. So if... 
if you have any questions about REM, pop them on our Instagram. I'd love to hear them. Um, drop us a DM. Equally, you can comment on this video. So whatever listening platform you're using, there's a little comment button. Just click comment, write your comments. Um, and do remember to click the notification bell that means, or the follow button, subscribe, whatever platform you're on. And that will help A, our ratings, because we'd love more people to benefit from the podcast. Um, but equally, it means you will get the notifications that say the next episode's out, so you're not going to miss out. Um, have a great week, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Dynamic Dog Owner with me, Debbie Potter. See you next time. Thank you.